Hi there, and thank you for checking out the campervan electrical design and wiring diagram. This short video will explain how to get the best out of this tool. Today we're going to show you how to complete this wiring diagram specifically for your build. Don't worry, we'll break it down into simple steps to help you through the process. If you've been reading the campervan electrics handbook, then using this tool will be quite straightforward. If you haven't read the book, that's okay, we'll talk you through how to use it anyway. The first few pages contain instructions on how to use this tool. There are fields you can enter data into, and they are the light blue boxes. Calculated fields are displayed in white boxes, and they cannot be edited. You can fill in the name of your van or project. We'll use Mowgli as an example. We can select our AC range, 220 to 240, or 110 to 130 volts AC. I'm going to go with the AC 110, only because I want to show you a feature later on. We can choose our preferred measurement scale, feet or meters. This is so we can work out our wire gauge uh, when we're measuring how far each component is within our van. We can select our preferred wire scale. In some parts of the world, it's easier to source millimeters squared, but it's also quite easy to find AWG. And lastly, we'll choose our base system. You can choose between 12 or 24 volts. The next table here, we list the load of our USB devices. The wiring diagram has two circuits for six USBs already configured. But here we're only interested in how much load they will take. You can see I filled in a couple of examples. Now we're going to measure the load in watts, but sometimes your phone or tablet or fridge or other appliance states how much the current it will use in amps rather than watts. We can use the calculator here to convert the current or amps into watts. As you can see, when I fill in the watts, I get the total hours. Fill in the rows for all your USB devices and make sure to leave nothing out. Part two of sizing the load is all about those DC circuits that you want to be switched. So you can turn them on and off from a control panel. For example, your water pump, bathroom light, the fridge, or maybe even the water heater. Again, we fill in the watts and the hours, and then we are shown the amp hours they take. This all helps size your battery bank. Now, here I have a 60 watt fridge, but depending on the climate, the compressor might run for six to eight hours a day in the winter, but could be as much as 18 hours in the summer. I'm gonna put the 18 hours down. Part three is for those DC circuits that are not switched, like your reversing camera, or the cabin heater, or the diesel cooker, or the roof vent fan, all of which have their own local switch. And if we look here, we can see the total DC load you will expect to use on a daily basis. If we look at the AC load, we do the same. We fill in the appliance, its watts, and how long you'll run it each day. I put three examples in here to show something that's really useful. I have my coffee maker, my TV and my laptop. You can see here in the summary pad, it's showing the largest load, which is my coffee maker. First thing in the morning, I'm gonna switch on my TV and my coffee machine and probably even my laptop to check out my emails. So if I tick all these boxes on the right to show that I will be using them at the same time, you will see that in the summary page, all the concurrent appliances will be totaled and this will drive the size of your inverter. We can decide how much battery contingency we want to carry over and above the minimum load. And this helps us plan for bad weather days. As we progress down the page, you will see the minimum battery bank sizes you would need to run for your planned loads. These are the battery totals for all the AC inverter and the DC loads. It has calculated the depth of discharge for each battery type. And so this is the minimum number of battery size that you should buy. You may get an odd number, so you might want to buy the next battery size up. We can choose lithium, gel, or AGM as our battery bank type. At the bottom of this page, we can decide if we're going to use the alternator to charge our batteries when we're driving. So we have a choice of B2B or VSR. And if we're not going to do this, we choose none. 
Looking at the solar charging, despite everything we have heard or read or dreamed of, we are limited by how many panels we can actually fit on our roof. You need to do a bit of measuring to get the maximum amount of solar panels you can fit on your roof. When you've decided that value, enter in the total watts here. Here we decide how much winter and summer sun we could expect to fall on our roofs. So for example, I've been down in Patagonia this last year, so I'm getting three hours in the winter and six hours in the summer. But you can choose the values for where you live or where you want to travel. Now these are just broad averages, and so if you know a more accurate figure, use that one instead. Now we can see how much energy our panels will generate in the summer and in the winter. And the third box shows how much energy we actually need to generate on a daily basis. These two boxes show how much energy you are in deficit or credit depending on a winter or summer's day. Here is a summary table of the information you've filled in already. It's worked out the minimum battery size you need, the solar panels that you stated you could fit on your roof, solar charge controller, minimum inverter size, B2B, VSI choice, and the minimum battery charger you would need. If you want to change the minimum specs, you can revise the tables above or move on to part two. We've carried over the minimum recommendations on this table, but you may have a different idea. If you want to put that bigger inverter or battery bank, then you can change them here. You could go smaller, but that's a choice knowing you are undersizing the system based on your expected loads. We can decide how many batteries we're going to fit on our drawing, as well as how many panels. Four batteries and five panels are the maximum. You can include battery monitoring if you're going to fit it, and shore power. If you chose 220 to 240 volts AC, a standard wiring configuration will automatically populate on the diagram. If you've chosen the 110 to 130, then you will need to specify 15, 30 or 50 amps as they are configured slightly different on the diagram as well. Now it's time to look at our circuit wiring. The wiring tables are pre-populated from our load list that we completed earlier in the process. As I fill in the distance for the fridge, you can see the wire size is automatically populated. If we look at the air compressor and the water heater, you will see they both have relays. The air compressor has a current draw higher than my switch rating, and so the table automatically calculates a relay size based on my switch. If I choose to put a larger switch in, say 10 amps, you'll notice it no longer needs a relay. I'm going to jump down now to look at the circuit diagram to show you how this is drawn because a relayed circuit is in effect two circuits one is switched and one for the appliance. Top left you can see the water heater is supplied by a switch on line C04. It's listed as a 16 AWG wire size and has a 0.5 amp fuse in the fuse block. Looking to the table for the relays below, you can see the water heater again is listed, but this time it has a relay for 60 amps, a few size of 30 amps, and the wire size is 48WG. We continue to complete the table for the non-switch circuits and our major components. Again, as we fill in the distance, the wire size will automatically populate in the table and be displayed on the wiring diagram. So there you have it, a completed wiring diagram to use as a build template for your camp fan. If you have any challenges in completing this diagram or you need any further information on your electric install, please contact us on the Camper Van Electrics Handbook Facebook page. And thank you for watching.